Hello, hello. Guess where I am back today. Back, back in high school. <laughs> I graduated from Vestavia Hills High School four years ago. And now, after graduating from college, I wanted to come back and see what's different. But specifically, I wanted to be able to see things from the teacher's view. Perhaps perspectives I wasn't able to understand from when I was 16 or 17. Alright, well, let's get started. Since the time that I graduated in 2020, you've taught hundreds of other students. What do you remember most about me, if anything? I just remember you had a good sense of humor. You always, I was always have like one or two kids in a class I kind of pick on a little bit that make the class fun. And uh, you were that kid in that class. I said, I said, you know, all of you guys will be successful, except for Eric. You know? <laughs> well, funny things I remember are you sprinting down the hill in your Crocs when you were late for early bird and us watching you out of Miss Gifford's window. I think that the thing that stands out most to me um, when I think about you, Eric, is the, um, like the dedication you had to bettering yourself as a writer and a thinker. It's your, your hard work in, in the classes. You know, you challenged yourself academically, which a lot of your peers did as well, but seeing the bigger picture of, yes, I, I need to do well in class or on this AP test, but there's life after I graduate from the Savia Hills High School. How we're hard you worked in class and how you did a really good job of doing your work and also making it fun. Like you spent a lot of time laughing with Shane Mackey, but y'all but y'all got your work done and you did what you were supposed to do and you made class fun. The way that you gave your speeches was different from everyone else. I don't know, just the way that you gave it, it really dropped people in and they were just kind of captivated by it. It's a rare thing that I see students set a very ambitious academic goal and actually meet that goal. And so I just remember with your writing, you ha we had optional assignments because it was 2020, you know, you didn't have to do that work. Um, but I remember you submitting all the optional assignments um, and taking my feedback and actually applying it the way <laughs> that it's supposed to be done. That's one thing I remember. And of uh, the many things like, uh, you know, the, the remote control here <laughs> that you gave me and, and then uh, just being a great guy. To the end, a great guy. What's the biggest thing that's changed at the school in the last four years? In the last four years? Um, I will, okay, because we're coming out of COVID, I think things are, are normalizing again. The amount of availability of material because of COVID. So when you're out, it's a lot, I think it's a lot easier to catch up. But I also think that that means sometimes people miss more because it's easier to catch up. Grace and that kind of lowering expectation uh, has echoed into 2024. Teachers and students are not holding each other to the same standard that we were before the pandemic. Um, like I think it's good that you're able to like log on to Google Classroom and kind of see what's happening for the upcoming week in a class. I mean that's a very like similar to a lot of college layouts that makes some students believe that like attendance in school isn't as important. I think we've had some attendance struggles kind of post 2020, kind of post COVID. And we've had a lot of like personnel turnover, like a lot of, it's like administration is completely different except for one assistant principal. We've had a fair amount of teachers retire in that amount of time. The uh, real establishment of like the freshman campus is, is significant. There's a freshman campus now, which was, didn't exist when you were here. So that's completely changed a lot. Um, less people in the hallways, less traffic. So that's, I guess, a positive. I think the biggest change is probably for, uh, for us teachers, sometimes I think it's the trying to figure out how students balance their mental health with academic. You know, they still have these lofty goals, but also I think what came out of the whole COVID crisis is that there's a much greater awareness of mental health issues that students face. And I think that we're seeing that in our students not being, I don't want to say not willing to do as much, but like they balance how much time they're going to dedicate to school and how much they're going to dedicate to their extracurriculars or things they enjoy. In one word, how would you describe your role as a teacher towards students? In one word. <laughs> Motivator. I have to motivate them to do their best because again, my students are in general the best, 
but they just need to be motivated to reach that. Available. If I have to be one word, it would be that. I really think that my one of my central purposes is to be present for the kids. I hope approachable. So I hope that they feel comfortable to approach me to learn and not feel like things are just prescribed to them um, and that they have to do things a certain way. Probably just facilitators. Learning is way more impactful and powerful when, when y'all are the ones doing it and it's kind of my job to facilitate instead of just talking at you. Facilitator. I was gonna say that or encourager, but I wasn't sure if that was actually <laughs> Happy? I like, I like what I do. Yeah. Supportive, dedicated. There's just a couple words, I guess. I want all students, I want them to know that that door is open for all of them, not just a certain group that I have to write recommendation letters for. And we could sit down and we can talk about college or a career, or we could just, they may have something going on at home. For y'all to open up at 17 or 18, you have to be a little vulnerable. My biggest thing is that I feel like every student that walks in the front door of the Sandy Hills High School every day needs to have somebody that they can go to, whether it's a teacher, a, a counselor, um, a lunchroom person, that they have somebody they can rely on. Mentor. I think mentors are part of someone else's journey. I like to use the metaphor that teachers are like rocks in the river and students like flow over us. We might divert you for a moment in a different path, uh, but you keep going and we remain. Uh, and we shape you for a moment, uh, but the more students that wash over us, we're shaped more and more uh, as people as well. But I think a mentor should be there like on the side of students and, um, and help showing you what's possible. And also like another word, if I want to give you a second one, <laughs> um, uh, avatar. Um, and what I mean by that, and I'm borrowing this from Penn and Teller, um, whichever the two of them is the quiet one. And he quotes somebody else that says that in order to get students to love subjects, that teachers have to become avatars for their content. So like, I want my students to think about AP Lang and then I want them to think about me. And if they're excited about my class and about me, they're going to be excited about language. Um, the same way a French teacher could like become the avatar for French in that student's life. And um, that's a big responsibility. So mentor and about a Jews on an avatar. Last question. Why do you think you're alive? Mm. Um, why do I think I'm alive? Why do I think I'm alive? <laughs> Me? Um, like purpose in life or outside of that? Why do you think you're alive? That's a big question. I guess to be a teacher. That's my role, yeah, that's my calling. I think that God has a purpose for my life as I seek to do His will each and every day that I fulfill the purpose that God has for me. Because my HP points have not gone to zero. <laughs> I'm a Christian, so I think that uh, part of my life is to glorify God. So I try to live my life for that, and I think that's part of why I'm alive, is to honor and glorify Him, yeah. I mean, I think I'm alive because God created me. Uh, my faith is very private, uh, but it's also very important to me. And I was created for a purpose, and, um, and that's to live like, like my God did. And now I'm, I'm alive for my, my daughter and for my wife. More than anything. I think because with my faith, that I believe that it's more than about your works and what you do. My, my road to where I am now, I was a, a very bumpy road. Um, but, but why I'm here, I, I, I try to be passionate about helping, helping young people, helping teenagers reach goals that they have, aspirations that they have. But I would say the biggest thing, the reason I'm here is because of my faith. I'm here, like in this, in this position and, and what, what's gotten me here. Um, I guess that, that's, that's why I'm alive. I mean, I, I could go into personal beliefs here, but um, I would say, I mean, hopefully I have a purpose and that um, I would say grace <laughs> is a reason that I'm alive. I have had people pour into me and invest in me and sacrifice for me, but I feel like those are all reasons combined together that I'm still alive and doing what I do. <laughs> 
I mean, I think my, I think my, oh, so I'll answer this purpose. I'll do the counselor thing and take your question and, and maybe turn it in a way that you didn't want. <laughs> I mean, I think my, my, my purpose is, is to assist, is, is to help through a series of events found like mental health and counseling along the way is to be the way for me to do that. When I graduated high school, I would have never guessed that this is where I would have been. Like in this field, I probably would have told you that would have been the last time I would have been invested in high school would have been, you know, the day of graduation. So a lot has occurred in those 24 years since then. For the good, I really enjoy what I do. So. Awesome, thank you. <laughs>